I'm Mel Stewart, and this is Swim Swam Podcast. Today, we have a very interesting topic, a topic that's been coming up uh, here and there, and it's something that I think you're going to be interested in. Uh, people are talking about it in the inter- industry, but there's some new companies that have entered the industry, especially in the U.S., and today the topic is launching a business in the middle of a pandemic. Launching, the, launching a business in the middle of a pandemic. That is a, that's a Herculean move. That's a big flex. And uh, there's a lot of reasons to do it. There's a lot of reasons not to do it. But we're going to talk about why you do it today. Today, we have some very interesting guests. We have Malmstrom Inc., a subsidiary of Malmstrom, Malmstrom AB. They're the global leader in racing lane lines and the standard bearer for racing lane lines for over three decades. Today, we have CEO Mike Orn. He's the 1984 Olympic medalist from Sweden. We have Vice President Simon Percy. He's the 1992 Olympian from New Zealand. Both are proud alums of ASU, and they, I, I think they're very proud of this. They helped to endow that program, which is now, of course, helmed by the famous coach, Bob Bowman. I'm going to put this in the show notes, but if you want to press pause right now, press pause. Go over to malmstrom.com, malmstrom.com. Check out their site and then come back to the show. Once again, we are... Our topic today, launching a business in the middle of the pandemic. That's our header, but let's let's do a little backstory first. Mike, Simon, you both have deep roots in the sport, obviously, with your D1 credentials, your Olympic credentials, and um, working in swimming, it's got to feel like coming back home. Is that right? Absolutely, Mel. Um, coming back and being part of the swimming community again, uh, three different areas for me. Uh, one, I'm running into old friends that I swam with. You know, you spend 20 hours in the pool every week, and then you do breakfast and you do lunch and you do dinner with those guys. When you meet those guys again, it's like yesterday. So that's one category. But then it doesn't stop there. I'm running into new friends that we have common friends with, and my network just expands and expands. Um, examples. Um, I was at Ask and I ran into a coach from Mexico City. He's friend from Ron Johnson. I swim with Ron Johnson. We compare notes. Um, I um, I ran into a distributor and he asked me, did I know Graham Wellborn? I said, of course. He said, well, I was his best reaching back to my old swimming buddies and my with Malmsten, Tommy himself, the Malmsten family, and all those Swedish swimmers that sort of, you know, helping out and and contacting me back. And a common thread on those three categories for me is that they're all cheering for us, they're all reaching out and they're offering to help to launch this business. It's a wonderful, wonderful time. Uh, For me, it's a a little different. I never really left the swimming world. I've coached since I graduated, but, um, you know, I have spent some times that I've I've been, I was coaching at ASU full time and and coming back to doing this. the, the, The times that I've been fully immersed in swimming professionally have been the most rewarding for me. They're just, it's just different than being out in the business world uh, it, there is a lot of camaraderie. Your conversations are with like-minded people, and it, it just does it does feel like home. But it's it's professionally extremely rewarding being back to the being back to the pool. You know, just on on that note, I I, I do want to let our audience members know something. If, if if you personally know Mike or you know Simon, and now you know what they're doing, there. Uh, you know, we got the CEO, we got the vice president of Malmstrom. You want to get in contact with them. You want to reconnect. Maybe, maybe you you know, you clearly could be a coach or could be an aquatics director with a tie to them. Um, check out the website and uh, you can email them. You can get the email on the website. I'm going to put it in the show notes or you can give them a call. Call them at 855-879-8270. So you can press pause right now and give them a ring. But they are back and they are in the midst and they are working with a great brand. Um, you know, I, I left the sport for many years guys. And it's, uh, I worked in entertainment for a long time and really loved that career, but I, 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 I missed swimming and, uh, I was, you know, I was living in Hollywood and I drove down to a U.S. nationals in Los Angeles at, at USC. And, uh, it was the weirdest experience. I thought, you know, no one would, would, you know, you, you feel like the world moves on without you if you've left a certain family. And I couldn't, I couldn't take 10 steps without someone saying, Hey, Bell, what's going on? Or, in, or engaging in a quick conversation, um, you know, it, it's, has that been your experience? Well, you know, what, what what's something that crystallizes uh, that that feeling about the swimming family? 
you know, I ran into a new and, and old friends at ASCA, and then they come back to Phoenix, and they give us a call, they come down to our warehouse, visit our office, look around and stuff like that, you know, and and I go and visit uh, pools here in the Phoenix area as well. Um, some of those folks you know, Mel, I think, you know, Mike Chasson was a coach at ASU, uh, Glenn Mills is associated with ASU as well, and my old buddy Brad Herring is the new coach for Arizona Christian University. It's just, it goes on and on. Yeah, I wouldn't have one crystallizing moment. It's just living living that whole idea. You know, I spend a portion of my day on the phone. I go through my contacts list and see who I haven't talked to in a while. And maybe that's an old coach that I coach with or somebody I know through the community. And it's really, you pick up the phone, you have a chat with them. It's different in that, you know, when you're calling a swimming person, they're happy to talk to you, you know, and, and they love to hear that there's new products, there's new companies coming to the market. What's, what's the latest, greatest thing, you know, and it's, it's the whole community is very supportive. What I like about you guys is I like your swimming credentials. I, I, I like the Olympic brotherhood. That's that, that feels good. But um, something I do appreciate is that, and, and this is not uncommon is that, uh, a lot of people have great credentials. They, they, they leave, they go out and have other careers and they, and they, they, they do very well. Mike, you have a long career at IBM. How did your experience with IBM, how's that, how's that going to apply to the aquatic industry? How's it going to impact it? I think there are three things uh, that come to mind. One is, is from IBM, uh, one is discipline. Second will be planning. And the third one will be ethics. Um, when I was at IBM, I ran a business within the IBM business. Uh, so you have to make decisions um, and those decisions will have consequences. Some of those consequences live for a very, very long time. So I'm taking that, um, you know, learning uh, back into uh, Malmsten and uh, applying it here. As an example, we were looking for a warehouse. Um, and that becomes a business decision that we're going to live with for a long time. How big do we need it to be? Can we live in it for five years? How high does it need to be? How do we keep it cool? Phoenix gets hot in the summer. <laughs> so it's just business. And uh, it's helpful that I've drawn a business before. Simon, I, I, it seems like you never really left. Is, is, that, is that an accurate statement? Did you, did you, yep. did you, I know you had a business career, but it seems like you never really stepped away from swimming. Is, is that an accurate statement? Yeah, I could. I I, did, I never wanted to get away, but you know, I've I've, I've always coached. I coach masters. I've, I've coached masters for almost thirty years now, um, and I love it. But but coaching masters is is tough to to feed a family, you know, the way that uh, they might prefer. So, you know, I've always done done other things as well, and 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 that's been um, rewarding. But so so when uh, Mike chatted with me early on about uh, joining with him on, on this project. I was in the middle of, of a, a very fulfilling and rewarding business venture. And my, you know, I had no thoughts. I wasn't looking for something else. It wasn't something that I had sought out. And, and my initial reaction was, you know, it's nice to be asked, but, but, you know, I'm not really interested, but as time went on, it, it was like this, this song you can't get out of your head. You know, you, you, you get that tune caught and, and, and I was like, gosh, dang it. <laughs> I guess I'm going back to the swimming world. I, I, this is just too intriguing. I got to get back. So it was, uh, it was, it was a really strange moment to, you know, like, cause my initial reaction and then even a week later, I was like, yeah, I guess, I guess I'm changing course here. So, you know, Mike and I have actually, we, we, we've, we've had our podcast moment before and he did share this and it's worth bringing back up in, in this moment we're having now, which is that uh, a lot of people will have careers. They come back to the sport. And it's almost like this chapter two, it's like, I'm not going to retire. I'm going to do what I, I'm going to do what I love in a space with, with, with people that I'm close to. So it's, uh, I think the, the feeling is, is standard. It's funny how you see this at industry get togethers that everyone's smiling. Um, let's bring it back to our topic, uh, launching a business in the middle of a pandemic. We think we're in the final wave now, but you know, I can't imagine doing something like this at this historic moment in time. We know we haven't had a pandemic in a century. Um, what motivated Malmstrom to launch the U.S. hub at this time? That's a really interesting question. And I think there are actually two different answers to that. The first part of the answer is that timing-wise, 
uh, it wasn't the pandemic that caused the timing. It was it was us moms then been looking at the North American market for a very long time. And a few different things happened. Uh, we launched uh, our third generation of a lane line uh, in uh, 2019 in Gangneung. And um, I went back and visited with Tommy and we talked about the fact that I was gonna uh, retire soon. Um, and we started making plans before the pandemic hit. hit. As a matter of fact, Tommy was, uh, he had a plane ticket to come over and visit us in March uh, last year. And we uh, luckily, in hindsight, um, canceled that ticket last minute and he did not come over. So then the pandemic started and uh, Tokyo Olympics was delayed a year. Um, and the question then becomes, should we continue to launch? And we decided, yes, we had to make some adjustments. But what we were able to do was to take advantage of the pandemic in the sense that we didn't have existing customers or commitments that we were struggling to fulfill. Instead, we can take our time and we systematically went in and started planning, looking around for the right uh, warehouses and quietly set up our business in good time um, under the cover of a pandemic. Um, and that just puts us in a really good position now when the pandemic is, knock on wood, hopefully, uh, easing up. Yeah, I, I agree. And uh, I feel like the status quo really favors the established companies. Um, but when we're in a, I think it's fair to say that there's nothing status quo about what we're working through and living through right now. And I think there's a lot of um, opportunity in, in a disruption like this, especially for a company that's looking to, it's established in the rest of the world, but it's not established in the US. So we're the newcomer to the market and we're, we're, we're there's opportunity in that disruption of patterns that, that we can take advantage of. You know, what's interesting is I can give you some context from, from my point of view, but I, I think we all felt this during the pandemic, uh, certainly with companies, certainly with, certainly with specific industries, but it seemed as though the pandemic was a truth serum. Uh, and that truth serum was, um, we found out very quickly who was resilient, who was smart, who was nimble. And uh, I would say over 20% of the companies in the aquatic market, um, evaporated. And I would say the smart ones were prepared. The smart ones with great, anybody, even if they were a small company and had a great brand, it seemed like everyone, they didn't panic. If they were making smart moves, they didn't panic, but they were doing a little bit like, like Mike was explaining, which is that they were, they were establishing new parts of their business, looking at new markets and really get taking that, that pause and that deep breath during this time to get organized. And, you know, the, you know, we, we did a podcast before, but our audience should know this, you know, Malmstrom has been, they've, they've, they've been the market leader now for three decades globally. And uh, this is, this is one market where it's like this, the U S market makes sense to come in and, and firmly establish the brand as, as the leader, as it is on the international stage. So in my opinion, it makes absolute sense that you would make this move at this time. The, uh, but it, it, it was tricky in this regard. You know, the, the Olympics weren't guaranteed. And uh, something happens emotionally within the market when, when we have an Olympics rolling up. Uh, people make bigger buys. Uh, there's an emotional drive behind it. Did you factor in that, you know, a, a plan for the Olympics not happening and the Olympics happening? I think you answered this before, but if you could just answer in a little more detail this time. Yeah, of course. You know, if you were... Um... An, an athlete uh, in the spring of 2020 and the Olympics are being postponed a year. That's a pretty big deal, right? Because now you have to make a decision on whether you're going to, are you going to swim one more year? <laughs> if you do, are you going to make it a year from now in the Olympic trials? You have to make that. We had the luxury of knowing that we were actually qualified to the Olympics already. You know, we were selected. So there wasn't the sense of panic in the same way. You know, for us, it was, okay, it's going to have, you know, we're still in Tokyo Olympics. It's going to be 2021 instead of 2020. Perhaps it's a little bit later, but we're in. And we had that in our back pocket. So it, in our case, it actually worked a bit in our favor because we got an extra year to plan. Um, but from a business decision perspective, no, we made adjustments, yes. 
we did not revisit whether we had a go or no go. It was always a go that we we're going to launch. We're here for the long run. We made our planning and we're ready to go. You know, I've been talking to Mike for a long time, Simon, but I, you know, when, when officially were you on board with, uh, with Malmstrom? Um, so officially when, I suppose August 1st um, would be the official start date, but we started talking 18 months, 20 months ahead of that. I want to say it was October of 2019 was the first conversation. Um, and I was in, so, you know, early in 2020, but, you know, part of the planning process involved in certain things, but also, you know, there, there's no, there's no, nothing to sell right now. So, you know, uh, I was continuing that with other career, my, my career and um, just, just waiting for this thing to launch, but, but involved in planning, involved in, in selecting warehouse space and all, all those kind of decisions. So um, yeah, I've, I've been, this, this has been in the works for a long time. I, I think this is Mike's MO. He starts talking to you, you know, a year, 18 months out, two years out. He, he's working on you. Is, is this, is this the, is this the way you move Mike? <laughs> well, I, I haven't thought about it that way, but, but perhaps it is. I am a pretty uh, persistent guy, so um, I, I like to hold the course right, once I figure out where it is. <laughs> well, it, it, this is an interesting question, and it's uh, it's something we, we covered in a topic in a, in a podcast before, but it's something I like to talk to you, you know, now about that's that I find fascinating, and it, it really is sort of the industry behind World Championships, the Olympics. But you know, just to, just to go on the record and and really crystallize it. You know, how soon uh, does Malmstrom start preparing for an Olympics? We start uh, three, uh, maybe even four years before the Olympics. So, for example, and for the Tokyo Olympics going back, uh, we had uh, meetings with the Japanese Swimming Federation at the World Championships in Budapest in 2017. That was the first meeting. Um, and then um, we did a visit, the Malmstrom family did, to Tokyo in the spring of 2018. And we actually started delivering product uh, in the fall of 2018. We uh, sent over one of our uh, chief technicians, uh, Jan Svensson, to deliver the water polo field. And in the fall of 2018, set it up, get it, you know, get all that fine tuning done because every pool is a little different. And uh, we wanna get a, an early start on those things. So three to four years out, now we are in the midst of preparing for Paris 2024. And, um, you know, it's the it's old, um, you know, when do we ship? Where do we ship to? How much of the product do we ship? It's all those things uh, that we need to go and do. Uh, I'll, I'll go even one better than that. On Monday, we had, Mike and I had a conversation about 2028 uh, LA Olympics and the steps that we need to put in place to make sure that the field of play that we put in place the lane lines that we put in place for that for those Olympics will be absolutely perfect. There's there's no bigger stage than the Olympics, especially for swimming. But when you're talking swimming Olympics, there's there's a you know people will watch that that would never otherwise watch Olympics. So it needs to be perfect. We we've started that conversation seven years ahead of time. You know what what how do we go back to our manufacturer to make sure the lane the discs that we put on the lane line are perfect. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of planning that goes into it, and it's, it's never too early to be ready. Mike answered this. Thank you, Simon. Mike answered this uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a previous question, but it's, you know, I, I got to call you guys out a little bit, and, 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 and here's why. I have one physical product. I have a magazine, which, which is really a joy to do and fun, but it's a big responsibility. It's, you know, I've got hard dates. I've got to ship. If people aren't receiving their product, they get upset. And uh, so I, ha I have just tiny little window into, into an understanding of what it means to be on, on, on your side. Um, you know, you talked about Paris in 2024 you, and you talk about, L you know, you're prepping for LA, but Paris, the trials for national Olympic trials are, are like 30 months away. World championships next year are re really about six months away. Um, are, does that not stress you out? I wouldn't say it's stressing us out so much, but there's a sense of urgency um, because we have to get on, get on it and, and be ready early. Um, you know, if you are, if you're an Olympic defending champion um, and you want to go back and go back to the Olympics again, four years later or three years later, um, 
you're not going to win that gold medal automatically. Um, we have the same sense. You know, we may we delivered well to Tokyo and, and other Olympics before that, but we had to go back and prove ourselves again. So it's not so much that we're stressing, I wouldn't say, but it is one that is time to roll up our sleeves and get all those project plans in place and really be sure that we're ready well in advance. Yeah, like, you, you got you to gotta remember your days as a swimmer that, um, you know, or swimmer or as a coach, that, that every day you, you can't stress out about the meet at the end of the season. All you can do every day is the best you can do. You know, and if you spend every day and string those days together and you prepare well and you think ahead and you keep that big goal in mind, that you'll be prepared. And there's no reason to stress at that point. You know, like if you, if you don't do those things, then yeah, that's when you get stressed when you, when you know you haven't done the work. But I, I know when I was standing behind the blocks or if I was coaching a kid that had done the work, I was never worried about their performance that they were going to perform. But, but you do the work every day. There's a certain level of, of if you do good work, I always feel like it's honest work. And if you do the honest work, you can live with the results. I, that's that, and that is the beauty of the of sport and what it's taught us. Uh, Malmstrom has endless aquatic products, and you're just coming off the biggest platform in in sport, the Olympic Games. From the telecast alone, did you did you hear from did you hear from potential clients? We did. Um, and we do, <laughs> but it's not only clients, actually. Uh, it was funny. I had um, told my uh, realtor that I was going to open up the business of doing swimming lane lines and such. And um, the Olympics comes on. She's watching it. She's not a swimmer, but she posts on Facebook because I check out those swimming lane line dividers. Aren't they beautiful? <laughs> it's one of those things when you see it, you can't unsee it. Um, so, but we have had examples like that. People call up or send us emails. Um, one of the visible things from the Olympics are the, the marking cones on a water polo field of play, you know, to indicate where the penalty shot is and such. And uh, it's funny, people, people look us up and they find us and they ask, uh, you know, do you have those in stock and how much are these? And of course, every time I get a small request like that, you know, there's always a potential to lead to something bigger. So, yeah, I think the Olympics were very helpful for us in terms of getting a little bit of visibility. Yeah. People actually had to work quite hard to find us through those field of play cones because the, there was no product labeling on them. They were blacked out because it was the Olympics. So they, they, they worked hard. And we, we nearly sold out of those right away. In fact, it, it just about broke my heart. I had to tell one prospective customer that we couldn't break up a set for them unfortunately because we uh, we were going to sell it so you know that the, when you're a new company and you're telling somebody we can't sell you what you want it, it breaks my heart uh, but a good problem to have it's a good problem yes. it's, a, it's a very good problem to have we like those problems i love I, I love it when i can cut when someone calls and i can say sorry we're sold out it, it was uh that that's it, it, but it hurts uh, yeah. everyone knows malmstrom uh, even some people, even if they, they think they don't know Malmstrom, they do know Malmstrom. They just, they, especially in the United States, uh, going back to the famous story of the, of the, of the, the Swedes, the goggles, um, which everyone wore, if you didn't wear them, you weren't cool. Um, but your, your presence in the U S market isn't as well established. People don't make the, the direct connection. Um, how are you working to, to change that so, so that everyone in the U.S. knows, hey, when you're watching World Championships and Olympic Games, you're looking at our product. What are you doing about that? Well, if, to me, uh, two things. One, we're doing a uh, more classic marketing approach. You know, we're taking out ads and, and doing uh, various outreach uh, with you, Mel, uh, for Swim Swim. We're also doing it with the Association of Aquatic Professionals. We went to ask you, you know, we go out and do that. That's that's a sort of a must do, and it's and it's very helpful. Um, the other side is the outreach, personal outreach, and the the, the word of mouth, and uh, and going out and talking to a coach, getting a water polo goal placed at the pool. Coaches talk, <laughs> and um, the word spreads, and then next thing you know is that you get a call from someone you don't know, but they had run into our products or heard about a product from one of our some of that we have spoken before. So it's the outreach and the networking that's 
perhaps a little bit more tangible as far as uh, getting the, you know, getting results on it because it's something we actually hear and see directly. Yeah, the, um, it's interesting you brought up the Swedish goggles because they're really generational and, and iconic in the sport that uh, kids today wear them a little bit less because there's, there's a variety of other similar products today. But when we were growing up in, in, in the sport, that was it. That that was the, the goggle of choice for most everybody. And there was, you know, yeah, you're right. You, if you weren't wearing those, you weren't cool. But probably the product, you, the other product you were wearing wasn't working as well either. So, you know, Malmsten products work very well. You just have to remind people that, well, you remember the Swedish goggles, Malmsten makes those. Um, but that's not the main thing they make them. Mainly they make lane lines. So it's an easy connection to bring through. But um you know, having having that iconic product out there that everyone really does know is, is a is an advantage. It's a good thing. No, the funny thing. The, the Swedish the Swedish goggles is um, it's actually really helpful because we bring it. You know, we brought them to Asia and we had them sitting at the table. And we offered them to be, you know, hey, come on over and grab a set of goggles. Right? If you haven't used them before, you can check them out. But while you're here, why don't you look and see what else we have on the table? Right. So it is one of those little things. It's not what I focus on so much to selling right now, but it is something that uh, is a uh, something that most people can relate to, even even some of the younger swimmers. It's uh, it. No, I love it. I love I love any 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 messaging, any marketing. Um, something that I, that I that I, people might be surprised, but at Swim Swam, we we advertise and we were a content business, but we advertise on platform and off platform. But I'm, you know, I might make 20 phone calls a day and I'm always talking and connecting to people, but I, I, I believe in, in, in always being present in everyone's mind. So that when you have that conversation, it's a productive conversation. It's, uh, so as we stand right now, the pandemic is still ongoing. And while the market's moving forward, we're, we're, we're not at full steam, although I'm, I'm seeing signs of that. Um, I'm seeing it on my side in terms of sales, in terms of seeing a lot of camps. Uh, the camp market was, it was a very vibrant market in swimming, and it was, it was completely flat in 2020. Came back about 20% in 2021. I'm seeing now the camp market looks like it's going to be 100% or higher going into 2022, but demand still seems uncertain. You know, it's, 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 I still feel some. I still feel the, the insecurity about the market. How, how are you managing that reality? What we manage is the fixed cost, the overhead, keep them at minimum. Uh, we don't have a lot of fixed costs that we have to pay every month, which is helpful. And then we spend the money on uh, when we need to. You know, If we have an opportunity to go and move some, some products, then we'll bring in folks and, and have it built you know, just in time, right? So we spend the money when we actually can make the money um so it's just living on shoestrings in in the sense we're ready to go and rock and roll when when that time comes but we don't have to build up a, a big set of uh, a fixed cost quite yet yeah i, I, I should I, i'm I interrupting you simon but i just have to say this i like the fact that you're in the uh in the warehouse never done a pod with, with video where i have so much product Banks behind you with, with the lane lines. Uh, kudos to you for for framing that. Um, did you did, did, had you been planning that for since we talked last week? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> so, so <laughs> I do, I, but but in direct contrast to what my, Mike said, we have a warehouse full of product. We have we are ready to go. So while we, I feel like we're in a really great position of being nimble, being able to uh, move on a dime. Um, but also being prepared that if, if an order comes in, uh, we, we're, we're ready to go. So we have we have items stocked and, and ready to sell. We have our supply chain moving along, uh, prepared well in advance um, that, you know, the, the, there's a balance between, you know, fortunately, you know, we, we are new to this market, but we are not new to the world. And, and Malmsten has done this before. So, um, you know, here our, our costs are low, but we do have a big brother that's, um, that's pushing product in our direction and it, it, it's been very helpful, but we, yeah, somebody calls up, we, we can get it done. There's an elephant in the room. It's something that's been in the news and, and, you know, in the last 14 days, increasingly this past week. And it's that story that the U S workforce 
his is uh, they're sitting down or they're slow to to return to the office. And it's the 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 idea that everyone's thought about the pandemic, they've thought through it, and they've, they're rethinking their lifestyle. Um, but I'm feeling it from all of our the people that we work with because they're trying to staff. Uh, we're trying to staff, and it's a little bit slower. Uh, we're we're, we're and, and in the U.S. market, as a as a point of fact, we're at a 40 year low for people returning to the workforce. Has that impacted your efforts in the U.S. market? Well, while we were planning um, and looking for warehouse spaces and all that stuff, having people working from home had the side effect of there was no traffic on the on the roads. <laughs> so we were able to actually cover quite a bit of, of, of a, uh, territory and looking things around. But you're right. Um, people are uh, working from home now. Uh, our business is such that we have to have people in the manufacturing uh, warehouse in order to get things done. But we have lucky in that we have uh, family members, both uh, by blood and by community, that are interested on, on helping us out and coming in and doing um, the work that we need to get done. So we have a little bit of a queue, uh, a queue up of uh, folks who are interested in that. Um, they're looking for a reason to get out of the house and um, come in and spend a little bit of time and, and, and make some money, right? And they can do that as a win-win for us. Um, we get the help just in time when we need it. For them, they can come in and work when it's a flexible time that works for them. And we both win because it is family and there's mutual trust when you do it that way. Yeah. Malmsten is a family owned and operated business. In fact, I can I could call up Sweden and, and talk to any number of Malmsten family members. They wouldn't necessarily understand my language coming from New Zealand, but they, I could talk to them. But um, you know, so we've we've adopted that same uh, that same philosophy. We're, we're staying close to home, but we have some natural resources here in, in, in Arizona. There's universities close, and this is you know this type of work is perfect for a university student for a, for a summer that's maybe taken a gap year or what have you. Come in for a few hours, you know, get get after it, get get paid, and and uh, schedule as you as you please, and and it seems to be working out pretty well. I like it. Now help me dream. Help me dream of the future. We're looking into our crystal ball. We're looking to the spring of, of 2024. We're on the eve of the Olympic Games. Where do you see Malmstrom at that point in time? Uh -huh. I like how you frame that as a dream. I, I like to dream and I like to dream big. <laughs> Um, when I think about Paris 2024, uh, I'm actually a little bit modest there. I think that we have a good chance to become one of the three, perhaps even one of the two top uh, um, distributors or manufacturers, rather, for uh, the aquatic uh, equipment in, in water polo and, and in swimming. Uh, so I think that will get us, set us in a good position where we will be in the mind of the uh, of uh, many of the buyers in the North American market, but that will set us up into the next quad. You know, think uh, 2028 in Los Angeles. Um, I wanna be in a position where we're well known enough where we can start partnering with the community and work together to prepare for making 2028 an absolutely awesome Olympic games. Um, I was privileged to be at the 1984 Olympic Games in Los Angeles. I have marked my calendar because I want to go back to Los Angeles for the Olympic Games again in 2028. Big celebration, big moment. I love it. Let me before before Simon comes in here and has has a has a final word. Um, it, just in terms of context, if if you guys are listening, some people might not be old enough to remember this, but after the boycott in 1980. Uh, there was a lot of discussion about the Olympics perhaps being dead and it being over. And it really didn't make sense in, in the marketplace. And uh, Uberoth came in and managed the 84 games. And the 84 games is held up as one of the most successful Olympics in history, in mo modern Olympics. But uh, everyone that I talk to thinks that we're, looks at 2028 and saying, this is going to come fast and it's going to be a big mo moment in sport. Strap in, Simon. Are you ready? <laughs> we, we're, we're ready. Yeah, I, I feel um, by 24, by Paris, then Malmsten will be a name that will be automatically on any uh, aquatics director's desk 
I need new lane lines. Who do I call? You know, there's a couple right now. We're not on that list right now, probably, but we will be by 2024. By 2028, that, that's the one of the greatest things about this country is that uh, there's so much opportunity here. There's so much innovation in this country. There's so much drive to make things successful. I have no doubt that the 2028 Olympics will be another defining moment in LA. And uh, we're, we're just looking forward to being a part of that. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to work from what you just said there. If you're an aquatics director, a coach, and you're making your purchasing decisions for lane lines or water polo equipment, uh, contact Mike or Simon at Malmstrom. You can go to the website, malmstrom.com. You can email them or call them at 855-879-8270. Before we shut down, do you guys have any parting thoughts? Mel, as always, it's a pleasure to talk to you. I, I love to have this little discussion in here, and uh, I'm just so glad to be back in the in the, in aquatics business and the swimming business and talking to old swimming friends like yourself, Mel. Uh, so thank you very much for having us on. You've been listening to the Swim Swam podcast. Stay tuned for new episodes every week. You can take Swim Swim Podcast on the go by subscribing on your favorite podcast platform. Look for links in the description below and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos as well.